Hi, welcome everybody to the Growth Lab's new development talk series. Thank you all for being here. Uh, my name is Patricio Olstein. I'm a research manager at the Growth Lab program at the Harvard Kennedy School, and I'll be moderating this session called Economic Policy During COVID-19, Addressing All the New Challenges with Maria Antonieta Alba, former Minister of Economy and Finance of Peru. We're very happy to have Maria Antonieta with us today. But just before I introduce her, let me, let me tell you a bit about where we are today for those that joined us from the web. Development Talks is a series of conversations with policymakers and academics working in international development organized by the Harvard Growth Lab. In case you didn't know us, the Growth Lab, based at Harvard University Center for International Development, is a research program led by Professor Ricardo Hausmann, who is also joining us in this session, working to understand the dynamics of economic growth and to translate those insights into more effective policymaking in developing countries. This development talk seminar provides a platform for practitioners and researchers to discuss the practice of development or analytical work centered on policy. The seminars take place on a bi-weekly basis. If you want to stay up to date with our research events, you can visit our website or follow us on social media or sign up to our quarterly newsletter more information can be found at www.growthlab.cid.harvard.edu. Also, we'd like to invite you all to attend our next development talk seminar in two weeks' time with Dr. Antoinette Sayet, Deputy Managing Director of the IMF. Now, without further ado, I would like to introduce today's speaker. Maria Antonieta Alba Luperdi served as Minister of Economy and Finance of Peru from 2019 to 2020. Before Maria Antonieta served as minister, she, has worked, she had worked in Peru's public administration for more than 10 years. She was director general of public budget at the ministry, and before that, she worked at various positions, not only in the Ministry of Economy and Finance, but also in the Ministry of Education and the Ministry of, of Development and Social Inclusion. Also worth noting for our Kennedy School audience, Maria Antonieta has not only a BA in economics from Universidad del Pacifico, but is also a graduate from the Master in Public Administration and International Development at the Harvard Kennedy School. We are honored to have her today. The format for today will be the following. I have a couple of questions here to kickstart the conversation. And then we will take some questions from the Growth Lab team. And finally, if we have some time, we'll open up uh, for questions for the broader audience. If you have questions you'd like to ask Maria Antonieta, I will ask you to please sign them in this Q&A button that appears right below in the Zoom window as well as your name, institution, and country, so we read it out loud, and we'll pick some of these and uh, ask Maria Antonieta. So now that we have a full house, let me just uh, start. So Maria Antonieta, Peru has shown an exceptional economic performance over the last two decades, resilient to global headwinds such as the global financial crisis and the end of the commodity super cycle. Nevertheless, as the COVID-19 crisis hit Peru, the country has suffered major economic losses, amongst the highest in the Latin America region, and has particularly struggled containing the, the spread of the virus. More recently, the recent polarized election after four presidents in the last five years has shown significant democratic malaise. I want to take this opportunity to ask in this context my first question. Do you think the Peruvian economic model has been a success so far? Hey, hi, I'm very glad to be here. So um, first I want to, uh, because we, are, we have here people from different countries, when, when we talk about the Peruvian economic model, I, maybe I am oversimplifying, but I think that we need to consider that this model has three major components. First is the macro, macroeconomic stability management, a, a huge compromise with discipline in, in the public finance management. The second is an open economy to trade. And the third is a pro proactive promotion to uh, private activity. So I think that to be fair, I think that the model has concrete results, but the results of the, la of the last elections uh, show that the model has its limit. If we just think about economic growth, I think that it's a model very dependent on commodity price. And we have not fostered, fostered sectors with high value added. So for instance, in Peru, uh, the agro-export boom, this miracle of, that they call about the agro-export sector is more an exception than a rule. Um, I think that uh, to the model, I think that there are three major limitations. First is uh, that notion, and this probably this is not specifically to the model, but I think to the 
to the common uh, understanding that we have Peruvians, I think that's the first uh, limitation is that there is an idea that economic growth was enough, was sufficient. What we call in Spanish, uh, el chorro económico, no? Uh, definitely the economic growth that the country had in the last years has not been inclusive. And there was a huge incapacity of the state to distribute wealth. We always see that we have this circle where you have economic growth that brings high tax revenue, and these should be translated into better public services for citizens. But that is not the, the, the reality in Peru because they are the state has a huge incapacity to deliver concrete results to the citizens. And I think that what we have seen in the last COVID crisis is how can this economic start of Latin America have less than 100 intensive care beds for 33 million Peruvians when the COVID started. So this is just an example that basic services has been neglected for the majority of Peruvians. So this is the first limitation I see. The second is, I think that there is a lack of a real commitment with regulating markets. So sometimes we say that we embrace the free market, but we haven't built institutions and the tools for ensuring competitiveness in the market and for sanctioning the cases that we have power uh, abuse of, of this dominant position in the market. And, and also during the COVID crisis, we saw how concentrated markets such as the oxygen market or the pharmaceutical mar uh, market generated a lot of frustrations in, in citizens. So in fact, I think that in last Christmas, we had a collusion in the price for Turkey for in the supermarket. So you have a lot of this uh, abuse of of dominant positions in the market. We say we, we love free market, but in practice, there is no free markets in, in many markets that are relevant for the citizens. And the third one, I think that there is an absence of institutions that represent the vast majority of Peruvians, uh, that represent their concerns, that put their concerns in the, in the agenda, but also that intermediate every time that we have social conflicts. So, I, I don't know if this happens in other countries, but the office of the prime minister in Peru has a big social conflict office. <laughs> and most of the most struggling times the prime minister has is because of these social uh, conflicts. And here I'm not just talking about political parties. These political parties is just a feature. We have lots, for instance, of informal workers that in other countries, that's in Argentina, they have like a body that represents them. So um, I think that this is also a major problem, not, not being able to represent the, the majority of Peruvians in, in the agenda. So I think that the result of these elections, as I already mentioned, has shown these, these problems and the limits of the model. I, I think that's extremely interesting. And I see the three points that you bring up, uh, both the incapacity of state of distribute wealth and provide public services, or the, the lack of commitment to regulated markets, and the absence of institutions to represent the mass majority, we can all link them to the provision of quality public services such as health and education. These appear particularly in these two. So on a prospective basis, what do you think could be done differently to improve the quality of health and education, public or private? I think like my, I have thought a lot about this in, in the last year. Uh, I think that if we, if we uh, review what happened in the last decades in Peru uh, within public sector institutions. Let's think, for instance, about macroeconomic stability and, and fiscal management. We decided after this huge crisis by the end of the 80s that we wanted stability uh, and we built those institutions that, that bring us stability. We have a central bank, and in fact, Julio Velarde is for many years considered the best central banker of the world. We put some rules um, and locks for compliance with fiscal rules within the Ministry of Finance. We also uh, built a uh, Superintendencia de, de Banque Seguros, this agency that oversees the, the, the financial services. And I think that what I have been thinking a lot about this is we build these institutions, these strong institutions, because I think that the establishment needed those institutions. So they generated a lot of pressure to have these and create these institutions because there is a simple notion that you cannot privatize those services. You cannot ask the private sector to give you policy, policy, monetary policy or you can't ask them the, the private sector to bring you a fiscal policy. So there is no coincidence that we have these, these institutions that 
provide services that cannot be provided by the private sector. We generated really, really good institutions. We generated all the conditions to, get, to have the best civil service. So uh, the, bank, the central bank and the SBS have a special uh, regimens that are, that are okay, that are meritocratic, that they have better salaries, they are, they are have some stability. So this is not bad. This is just understanding that in order to provide good public services, you need the best people there. But what happened with other uh, services that I will say that in, com in comparison to these ones that bring you macroeconomic stability, what happens to those services that bring you like social stability or social development? What happened with education? What happened with health? Even security. Um, I think that the establishment realized that they can consume those services in the private sector. So we have a not only a no pressure to the public in the public sector to deliver good public education, good private education, but um, we went to the private sector and now you have a huge segmentation when you have families that can really buy very good education, uh, but very expensive. And you have families that do huge um, efforts to pay 20 or $30 each, each month for a school fee and they have really, really bad education because also, uh, because these are schools that work really good for the elite, they decided, okay, we are fine like, like that. We don't want you state. And every time the state wants to improve the agenda of regulating the private services, the private provision of the schools, or we have huge problems there because the elite doesn't want them to be regulated. So I think that we are in a very, very, terrible equilibrium where um, we have normalized privilege. We have normalized the fact that if you want to have really good education and you want to have really good health, you need to have money and consume that in the, in the, in the private sector. So I think that the government in some point or the public sector has resigned to provide good public services, but it has also resigned to supervise the quality of, of the private sector. So I think that we are stagnated in this in this equilibrium and, and we need to get out of there. And do you think we're in a heading to a political moment where change can happen better given unrest? To be honest, um, I, I think that my huge concern is that improving living conditions for Peruvian is never in the agenda. Never, like um, we, um, like, I don't know, like we have, we are, we are stuck in the last, I think, a month about election and a lot of fragmentation, but nobody is very conscious about what is happening with the anemia, what is happening with learning outcomes. So I am, um, I am, uh, I think that uh, like the population is, uh, very frustrated with the outcomes, but I don't see really a commitment to improve significantly the delivery of public services. Definitely. Uh, I want to change uh, the topic to COVID-19 since it's the title of the conversation. And uh, you took over office in the Ministry of Economic and Finance in October 2019. And five months later, we had the first confirmed COVID-19 cases uh, case in Peru suddenly the entire policy world and our teams at the Growth Lab really know this, and it's not just health ministers, but finance ministers, pretty much everybody, we we're all forced to learn an entire new vocabulary. We learned what a lockdown was, what a non-pharmaceutical intervention was, what flattening the curve, testing and tracing. And I wonder, as a, as a finance minister, you also have to adapt to this new reality. So I wonder, what was the hardest thing about it? How did you go through it? Yes, I think that uh, we need to remember or understand the nature of this economic crisis. Uh, usually, you, as a Minister of Finance, you face economic crises that are related to economic variables, such as a, a crisis of, of the crisis of debt in another country or overheating of our economy. In this case, the origin of the crisis was sanitary. And in front of the impossibility of the health system or the sanitary system to address this crisis, you came to a, a instrument of economic to try to help in the, in the, in the, in the response to this crisis. And, and to be like numbers in Peru were really, really tough 
as I already mentioned, uh, when by the beginning of March, we had less than 100 intensive care beds for 33 million of Peruvians. So for us, uh, so we implemented this very aggressive uh, lockdown in order to avoid a collapse in the, in the health system, but also to uh, provide some, of course, resources. And, and, and the, the idea was that in, during this lockdown, the health system was able to strengthen and to avoid their collapse. So in this context, when you as a Minister of Finance face a crisis that it doesn't have a origin in a economic variable, but in a sanitary crisis, I, I think that I have a, like two reflections there. The first is that there was not a manual, there was not literature, there was a lot of uncertainty. I, I was, a, people doesn't remember this, but the first case that we have in Peru was March 6, at least the first formal case. But in a conference, in a first conference in March 30, WHO was uh, say, saying that the face masks were not recommended. So imagine that like policymakers, we didn't have so much information. So there were lots of uncertainties. And every decision, and, and the second reflection is um, the errors that, that happens here are paid in human lives. So as Minister of Finance, you understand that your field of experience is not enough in this context, uh, like closing or opening the economy again. So I think that ministers of health play a key role now in the management of this crisis. You really need to, you really need to, to work very close together with them. And I, I know that in, in some countries was discussed about this paradigm, this paradigm between health and versus economy. And I think that for us in the government, uh, what was clear is that we wanted to avoid the most uh, human uh, losses. So we didn't face really like this huge parody. We didn't have a huge fights between the Minister of Finance and the Minister of Health. But we, have, we had very, very difficult structural conditions because of a very, very weak health system. That's very interesting, and uh, we've heard from from our work across lab with other counterparts that we there are a lot of countries with very similar conditions in the in the developing world. I was wondering, particularly regarding lockdowns, and I know that lockdowns and non-pharmaceutical interventions such as closure of borders and schools have been a big part of Peru's mitigation strategy, as you said, in order to avoid a collapse in health system and given. Uh, low numbers of beds and doctors to begin with. Uh, Peru was effectively the first country in Latin America to implement a lockdown and was later followed by others, Argentina, Colombia, Chile, etc. And I wonder, uh, what do you think uh, one year later about how lockdowns have worked? Do you think they worked in practice? Do you think something could have been done differently? Yes, I think that there is lots of heterogeneity within countries. And I think it's, it's difficult to identify common trends. And also another important feature here is the counterfactual. So that is also very difficult to measure. Like in Peru, we had a, with a, this lockdown, we have two waves. Maybe without the lockdown, we won't have two waves, but a tsunami. So it's very complicated, this idea of, of the counterfactuals and, and this idea of identifying trends. I think that in order for the lockdowns to be effective, I think that there are three, three important variables here. The first is early detection. You, you need to implement the lockdown at the earliest stage of the infection. And even though we were the, the first country to give us this lockdown, I was reviewing uh, some experts. This was, we gave the lockdown by the mid March. I was reviewing um, some documentation and some papers that are um, from some experts that they suggest that in Peru, probably the infection started before that. Before that, the Minister of Health, the Ministry of Health really say this is the first case on March 6. So this is something about early detention, detection and having a lockdown timely. At that time, we had a very quick response, but some initial analysis reflect that probably the, the virus was there many weeks ago. The second is about the intensity of the lockdown. Uh, and this is related to whether or not you almost 
uh, close uh, the territory, you close airports, you, clo you close interprovincial uh, transportation. And I see, and I think that in the case of Peru, uh, we can say that when we implemented that lockdown, we like block the virus in Lima and we delay the infection in other regions. And this is very important because if you had the levels of infection that you had in Lima, that is a, a city that has a third part of the population and, you ha and, and the system was already collapsed. It, at the same time, you had that infection in eight major cities. I really don't know what will happen. Like we had Lima and then we had Loreto and then we had like regions started. So I think that there wasn't, I can, I don't, I haven't checked the evidence or have a regression on this, but I think that we were able to like to delay the infection in different regions because it was impossible for the system to handle uh, infections in, in major cities at the same time. And then the third component is about enforcement, <laughs> whether or not your system and whether or not that culture of your citizens really, really respect the law. And, and you can say, you can also see that in Peru in the first week, the mobility index really, really was stagnating in, in low levels, but then you can see that people start uh, moving around. So I think that these three things are, are important in, in the moment of deciding a lockdown. If, if I could just follow up, like, I think it's interesting that it happens in a lot of countries we work where there's high degrees of informality. So like curfews generally are not as effective in preventing people who need to make a day-to-day -day living, particularly high levels of self-employment or people who need to go shopping every day. And I, I think I saw a question in the Q&A about that. Uh, how do you think this interacted in Peru's case with, the high, with Peru's high levels of informality? I think that it was a most, I think that the most important uh, tools that the government uh, designed for, for reacting to the crisis were not like that, if we expected 100% of effectiveness, we didn't get that because of informality. And as an example, for instance, because of this informality, we decided to implement a massive uh, program of cash transfers to households. And when we uh, approved very quickly all the, all the laws that were required for that, when you start with the implementation, you face these structural barriers such as like in Peru, only four or of 10 adults have a bank account. Uh, the infrastructure of the National Bank of the Banco de la Nación had less than 1000 ATMs at that moment for all the country. So even though we had this idea of giving liquidity to the households, it was very slow because of these structural problems, informality, here, we didn't have even the data sets. We don't have any information of the citizens. We have to build a data, a data set on that. So I think that, uh, yes, informality was a huge barrier for implementing all our tools and our, all our response to the crisis. Uh, you mentioned the, the transfer to households. I think uh, our, some of our non-Peruvian audience might not know this, but Peru has one of the largest digital packages in the region. And uh, I understand there's like long discussions about the implementations of some of the, these programs within the public sector, between the private sector, particularly regarding the loan guarantee. But even without either going through these discussions, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit for the audience, uh, what measures did, uh, did the government when you were finance minister took in response to a pandemic, economic or social? And I even have like a question here that asks about what did, what did Peru do to improve public services during the pandemic? Uh, and uh, is there anything thing that you think that could have been done differently as well to tackle the effects of the crisis? So two parts. Yeah. First, like informative, just to get us all up to speed. And second, what do you think about that? In yes, I want to also uh, tell this story that the first day that we decided, the first day that we were supposed to have this a, a cabinet of ministers to approve the, decree, the supreme decree of the lockdown. That day at 7 a.m., I had this meeting with the former president Vizcarra and Julio Velarde, the president of the central bank. We were on a Sunday very early with, they're talking about this lockdown. And, and Julio eh, told me something that was really important. He told me like, Tony, your, your best economic plan is to eh, support 
the Ministry of Health to contain the virus. Like you need to get rid of this virus. <laughs> that doesn't get your, your most effective economic plan now. So we decided um, at an economic plan, and I also have to say that uh, Professor Ricardo Hausman, uh, Professor Andres Velasco, they were really, really important for us to, we had several discussions with them. Our plan has two phases, a containment phase and an economic reactivation. Of course, in our minds, we wanted the containment phase to, to finish so the, the earliest possible to start with the economic reactivation. Trans going in, in these two phases, of course, depended at that time a lot in, sanita in sanitary variables. Uh, the plan was 20 points of the GDP. Around eight points uh, is public budget. Then, uh, and the other big junk is 11 points of the guarantee for credit loans, this very famous program, Reactiva, that for me is the best example of the combination an interaction between fiscal policy and monetary policy. And within the plan, I think that we defined three major priorities. First was strengthening the health system. The second was to protect enterprises and households. So in the first, you have all the money that we gave to the sector like um, to improve that their capacity. Uh, then the second was protect enterprises and, and households. And then we have this cash transfer program. And the third was liquidity measures, like a massive um, injection of liquidity in the economy to avoid a collapse in the payment chain and it was reactiva. And as I already mentioned, I think that the, the main takeaway is that structural gaps in the country were huge barriers to deploy the instruments in the way that we designed them. That's what I, I already talked about the cash transfer program. So in the first one, and this is related to the question about strengthening the health system, uh, and this is related to, to this idea of how we build capacity. Uh, at that time, we had uh, two big issues. Like we have all the issues of the clinical aspects of the pandemic, and then we had to build capacity. We have we needed more intensive care beds. We need more hospitals. So what we did, and the Minister of Health was really collapsed by the clinical and the sanitary issue. What we did is we generated an, a legal, a special legal framework and bring to the table the most effective units of the government in executing budget and in ex, and implementing procurement process and in fact, in implementing things. I don't know if you remember about two, year, two years ago of that, we had the Pan-American Games in, in, in Lima and the, like the unit in charge of all the implementation was very, very effective. They have a huge reputation of being very, very good deliver. So we built all the legal framework and we brought to the table like three or four special units to help the Minister of Health to build temporary hospitals, to buy um, all the equipment required for intensive care beds, even a, an agency that depended from the Minister of Finance called Peru Compras supported the Minister of Health in buying rapid and molecular tests. So we just bring to the table very, very effective agencies to help with all the implementation. And so the Minister of Health can focus on the clinical and we had to generate urgent decrease to, to, to all of that. Then uh, we have this massive cash transfer. It was to 8. Million household that is almost 60% of Peruvian households. And as already mentioned, we have huge barriers um, for giving quickly the liquidity to the families, not only because the low levels of social of financial inclusion, but also the National Bank didn't have um, so much ATMs going to the bank. You have this um, population that really wants to go to the bank and and take out the money from there. So that was also a point of spreading of the virus so that we had huge challenges on that. And we don't even have a complete registry of citizens. So we had really to build a, like almost like a, a new registry a, where you can tell that we had a huge problem with having information of our citizens that can really tell you how much the, the, the state is connected to citizens. Then we have Reactiva Peru. Um, that was this um, program where we gave loans to enterprises, the money, the liquidity was from the central bank, the treasury guarantee these loans, 
And I think that a very uh, important innovation is um, we had this, we wanted to, to really have very low interest rates for this program. So we generate uh, the central bank, uh, the way they allocated these funds within the banks and the financial institutions was through auctions. So each one in this auction, the, the, the money was given to the in financial institutions that presented the lowest interest rate. So the, the impact there was really, really important. For instance, in, in, in Peru, without in a regular moment, the interest rate that, is, that a small enterprise face at the financial system can be 40% 40, 40 of interest rate. And in Reactiva, it was less than 2%. So it was really, really a very innovative program. And I think that we, uh, that Reactiva, and then we have some uh, customized, uh, very similar programs, for instance, customized to agriculture. I think that at the end, we uh, give these loans for, for almost 800,000 enterprises. And then uh, this was part of the contention. And, and during the reactivation, that, that was by this, the second part of the year, in addition to opening the economy, and that was also a political economy process when you have to select what do you will the, the casinos, <laughs> what do you will the charges. It was also like a political economical uh, situation there. Um, we uh, decided a specific um, public investment interventions. We, as Minister of Finance, we worked really close with ministers of transport with these ministers that were supposed to design, um, we, we designed a massive program for fixing roads, for instance. And we developed a standardized terms of reference for local governments to do all the, process, or all the procurement process of the system. And then we had a daily monitoring of, of, of the execution of the funds. Um, and in the middle of the crisis, <laughs> That was a complicated crisis. I had also to do a damage controls in some populist laws from the, from the Congress. There is, in fact, one journalist that referred to this situation as Peru was facing two pandemias, the coronavirus and the populism from the Congress. This Congress um, was a Congress that had only 18 months to deliver results. You, I don't know if you know, but the Congress was closed uh, by President Vizcarra. They called for a new Congress. So you had new Congress that has 18 months to deliver results in a, a, in a pre-electoral moment because the political party, parties were going to participate in the, in the electoral a, a process for the next year. So I had to, to do a lot of damage control there. I invested a huge amount of my time going to the Congress. And not only I had to go um, to explain why, um, why I always tell them like, you know, Peru doesn't end with the pandemia or with the elections. We have a country to build. We have to think about new generations. And these, uh, these um, laws that you are proposing will generate more problems and solutions. So that was a, a very like a very important part of my time. And, and in fact, I was also interpelled twice by the Congress. So it was really, really um, difficult times. Uh, what I should have done uh, better, I think that um, we had a, a huge issue about uh, the pension funds. Finally, the Congress approved uh, a law that was declared unconstitutional by the, the Tribunal Constitucional, that is the highest body that interprets constitution. So maybe there I think that I had to react uh, on time. I, I, I took a, a while to send a contra proposal to the, of, of this law to the Congress. And the other uh, was about the narrative. I think that also I was very criticized by the Congress because of not helping the um, small and medium enterprises. And, and that uh, speech was already in the minds of everybody, even though Reactiva, most, more than 90% of the loans were given to these enterprises, like what this speech was all already there. So I think that I should have uh, be more like better communicate, communicating what, what, what we were doing with 
small and medium enterprises? I think we can take up that point because I have two questions in the Q&A exactly about small and medium enterprise. So maybe like I just read, I have one from Andrea Arviles who asked us, uh, maybe a Rectia program, some people criticize the program because it mainly benefited big, big business and there was little to no support of small medium enterprise. What do you do to support business who are not benefited by Rectiva? And uh, I have another uh, anonymous question that talks about the high tax burden to, for small businesses and also what, what, ha what had been done to small businesses. So perhaps we can just spend a minute or two talking about what, what was done for small businesses. Yeah, um, that is part of, of what, of, there is this narrative about the Reactiva and the small uh, and medium enterprises. And the fact is that the numbers are there, like more, more than 90% of the, enterprises that receive the loans were small enterprises. Of course, in, in, in when you think about the amounts, uh, the numbers are reduced because you are you are giving them to pay the, for the payroll for three months or to pay for expenses for three months. So of course, their expenses were lower than huge enterprises. But I think that the problem that we faced was informality, again. Um, most of the information to identify these uh, enterprises was, was from the uh, tax administration. So what we have in Peru, you have um, hybrids, you have uh, small enterprises that half of them are formal and the other half is informal. So the information that we had at the moment didn't allow us to help all of them because they were informal. So they didn't appear like, the, the amount of, of, of the money that they need or, or, their, or how much they, they sell, their sales were not uh, reported in the system. So we knowing about that, knowing about Reactiva, uh, what that problem, we generated another, other programs like FAE, El Fondo de Apoyo Empresarial, where we at some point uh, were much more flexible about the requisites for, for receiving the, the loans. But I think that um, in general, uh, there is a huge problem of productivity with small enterprises that explains informality. And what I was also very conscious about is what it was that during a crisis, like without the crisis, the small and medium enterprises, only 5% had uh, loans in the financial system. So I, I knew that in a crisis, it was impossible to solve a structural problem. I, I was con con conscious about that. I, I couldn't during the crisis solve that, but I think that what we gain in reduction of interest rates, the example that I gave you from 40 to less than two was really impressive. Yeah. Thank you. And so eventually vaccination will advance and Peru and the rest of the world will all reach herd immunity and the COVID-19 crisis will be left behind, hopefully for everybody. Nevertheless, uh, there are enormous challenges ahead for the rest of the world, for pretty much everybody. In the case of Peru, we know at least from private and multinational projections that Peru is not expected to recover its 2019 income per capita until 2023. And of course, the current election leaves a lot of uncertainty about the country's political future. So I was wondering in this context, what do you think will be Peru's most important political and or economic challenges in the year ahead? Yes, I see like um, when we see these, the results of this election and when you see social media and when you see um, what is happening in the country, I see that we have two extremes. Uh, the first extreme is a defense of the status quo that for me, it doesn't make sense the actual system is functional for only a minority of Peruvians. So defending the status quo is not a possibility, but you have some one extreme that, that wants that. And then you have the other extreme of radical change that they don't even want to, to maintain what already works. Like the country has demonstrated that we, that we know how to be a disciplined in our public finances. Of course, this has in enormous good results every time we want to issue bonds in the international market. So there are things that we have done right, that we have learned how to do. So you can not just like destroy. So my, my real concern is that 
the country politically and economically. I think that is part of the discussion. I, I always remember Andres Velasco telling that econo economy and policy go in the same <laughs> uh, road. Uh, I think that the huge challenge for Peru now is um, to reach a growth and, 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 and development that includes, includes population. And not only um, work um, in that line, but I, only, I also think that we need to build a political party that represents that, that represents responsible change, that represents the middle. Like there, you, you have extremes, but I think that we don't have uh, institutions or spaces that represent what most of us think. Because if you see like numbers, I think that less than 4 million Peruvians vote for one option or the other. So I think that the challenge for next years is to build only this story about responsible change, about development that really includes much more people, and also to build a political force that represents that. And a political force that values pluralism. And I think that is, this is very relevant in Latin America because we are seeing lots and lots of populism. And I think that populism sometimes wants to sell themselves as they are pursuing the public interest, but, but they are not. So I think that, and, and to be honest, it, it's very difficult. And it was a position I had sometimes, like there are these popular laws, uh, for instance, getting money from your pension fund. That, that, that sounds amazing. That sounds very popular. And, and you have to be the one that stands there and says, no, I, this is not good. I am not going to support this initiative. So I think that it also takes uh, having a political representation that really that really thinks about the center and really thinks about, okay, let's do a responsible change. Thank you, Antonieta. I will change a bit the topic and ask a few more questions and then I'll open up for Q&A. Uh, if anybody wants to start writing down questions, we will get to them in just a few minutes without some tone. Uh, so you became Minister of Economy and Finance with more than 10 years of experience in the public sector, but you are still the youngest person to be in this position. You were also the third woman finance minister in a country that had 270 finance ministers. I had to check that out. Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, did ageism or sexism ever come into play during your time as minister? Yes, yes, I think that definitely. Um, when I was appointed minister, I was already working more than 10 years in the government, and I had a position really relevant at the Ministry of Finance, that I was the general director of, of the National Bureau of Public Budget of the country. So I was in charge of this office that is, for me, is the heart of the Peruvian uh, government. Uh, I was appointed at 34 years old. In fact, there was some years ago, uh, a man that was also appointed at that age, but nobody said anything about, he was like a star, you know? <laughs> um, um, nobody, when, when he was appointed minister at my same age, and nobody said, nobody talked about, uh, about his, his, his age. Now, I think that there was a, a part of, popula of the population that was trying to understand why I was appointed minister. So they came with the first reason is that um, my, fa my father was supposed to be friends to the president. That was one explanation. Now that is, that is not true. Uh, to be honest, my, my dad has been professor of, I can say decades of civil engineers in, in, in Peru. He's a professor at the Universidad Nacional de Ingeniería. So most of civil engineers that went to this university, my dad has teach them. So uh, the former president was his former student and that's a, and the, the, but with this they explained that my, my dad was a very close friend to the president and because of that I, I was appointed. So that was not true. But the second explanation was that, is, was that because of my age, because I was a woman, I was going to be like a puppet of the, for the president. And I won't, I wasn't, I won't be able to say uh, no to him. But they didn't realize, if you know a little bit about the government, you realize that as general director of budget, you have to say a lot of no's <laughs> because lots of people, lots of ministries, lots of, of majors will, will ask you for, for money. And then, so that was the, the first reaction. And then um, 
during a, during a, when I was minister, sometimes a, they talk about how I was dressed. I didn't wear makeup. A, sometimes I had a, I don't remember how you say ojeras. A, I, some, I, I think, I don't know. A, and sometimes they appear in the media, like, you know, the minister has eye bags. And so I think that's for a guy. I, I don't think that, that that is the case for a, for a, for a man, but um, yeah, I, it was it was difficult also in that sense. And and I, I guess even all that we talked, like we experienced through COVID nineteen, it, it must have been incredible work hours and and unprecedented challenges. So I have to ask this: Would you go back to public office in Peru? Um, yes, yes. I, I think that uh, my vocation is was to be a public servant. I am trained for that. And in fact, since I start my professional career, the only two opportunities I, I have not been serving in the public sector was my two years at Kennedy School. And now that I, I uh, as you know, I had to left office because the president was impeached. I really, and, and I have uh, two reflections here. The first is that uh, I really think that more ministers in the country have to, have to come from the public sector. In the public sector, you are trained to stand after the country's interest. Uh, you are trained to look for the, the for the common interests. And if you go to, like if you compare these two experience in the in the private sector, imagine like the most important bank of the country. In order to select their CFO, they will never think about someone that has never worked in the in the financial system. So I really don't understand why. When we sometimes appoint ministers, we think like if the private sector will never put someone that, that doesn't have experience there, why when you have to um, appoint a minister, you need to put someone from, from there. No? And I, am, I have a lot of critics in Spanish, with, we say uh, puertas giratorias, like revolving doors. I am very critical about those, first, those people that is minister goes to the private sector, to the bank, and then come back. I, I, really, I really think that the government needs ministers that are trained in the public sector. And the other uh, important thing that I have to tell also is that it's, it's, it's very difficult nowadays to be a public sector servant in Peru. I think that there is a huge uh, disincentive because in sometimes you are dealing with a judicial system that is not necessarily rational. You, you, don't, you don't know how they're going to react. So they ha you have lots of preventive pressures to former presidents, not necessarily um, with, the, uh, with all the, like, not necessarily with all the, the reasons or the cause there. And I think that we are also in a very perverse equilibrium where you have media that reproduces fake news. And sometimes this information is used by the, uh, by the prosecutor of the government. So you have there a, a lot of things that you can be acting right, but you don't know at the end of the day what the judiciary system, how they will react. And that is really, and, that, and I think that is really relevant. I was thinking the other day that, of course, in, during the crisis, public servants had to take risks. Uh, for instance, in Chile, they bought Sinovac, that I am sure that when they bought it, they really wanted to ensure that the country had the most amount of vaccines. And then you have that is not as effective. If you that, do that in Peru, I am sure that uh, the minister that uh, um, was part of that decision will have the prosecutor will have the attorney of the government. So I think that that uh, it's very risky now for a public servant to take uh, decisions because you have this perverse incentive. I think both comments that you are extremely accurate for many of the countries we work with. Mm -hmm. I, I have a last question and then I'll, I'll give Ricardo the microphone. But I have to ask this because we are at the Harvard Kennedy School, at least virtually right now. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you were a graduate of the MPAD, the International Development Program at the Harvard Kennedy School in 2014. And I wanted to ask, how did your experience in this program prepare you for the challenge of public office? Um, I think that there are um, three important things, I think. The first is uh, this idea of the trinity of public policy that 
each um, good public policy needs to have a, a technical rigorously design, then uh, thinking about the upper, how feasible is in the, in the territory and then the political decision and be able to, to, in, to transmit why this is important. I think that this triangle was really, really important uh, for me. Of course, depending of the, on the position that you are in the government, you need to build your gaps for, for as a minister. I, the part, the communicational part, I had to invest many hours in training every time I, I went to interviews. But I think that this idea of, of being uh, conscious about these three important factors and also uh, this, this triangle also tells you that you need to work with teams in the government because one person not necessarily has all the competence to to develop all these three things. The, the second is, uh, is what our professor, uh, Dan Levy, Levy, Levy always told us that we had to be smart consumers of, of data. And when I was a minister, even though I came, like if you're a minister of finance, you can come from the economic side or from the treasury side. I came from the treasury side and most of my training was there so now as minister, I had to deal with um, eight or 10 general directors of different topics. And I remember my, my basic econometrics class <laughs> was really, really important to, to, to try to follow, uh, even though some topics were new to me. I think that that was really fundamental. And the third is the network. Like it was amazing during the crisis. I will just send a, a chat to my WhatsApp group of my friends from Kennedy School and ask them, hey, what are you doing in this issue uh, in Colombia, in Chile, in Mexico? And they will just answer to me. <laughs> and the other are the professors, you know, like um, Michael Walton, Ricardo Hausman, uh, Land Pritchett, that they were, after, after, being, uh, after finishing uh, my master, they were always available there. Uh, to help you in, in different situations. I, I don't recall the, num the, 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 the um, all the Sundays that Ricardo <laughs> invested in meetings with my team in the Ministry of, of Finance. So I am very grateful about that. Okay, let's try then using this opportunity, let's try to get Ricardo online and see if he has any comments or questions. Oh, it worked. Okay, good. <laughs> Excellent. No, well, uh, thank you uh, very much. Um, uh, Tony, for this uh, uh, splendid uh, and frank conversation. I, I have two questions for you. The first one has to do with, um, you know, what are the lessons in, in terms of setting in the government itself up to learn from its own actions? That is that we knew at the beginning that we didn't know much about the pandemic and we didn't know much about these uh, non-pharmaceutical interventions that had to be made and so on. But, but in, in, you know, when looking at the data, well, what's amazing about Peru is that, is that we have these peaks, but in many countries, these peaks are followed by a trough, but in, in Peru, it's these peaks are followed by a high meseta, a high, <laughs> a high land uh, uh, before, before they come down. So they're, they're very long, these, these peaks. And I was wondering, if there's anything about you know um, having mechanisms for the government to uh, to learn from these from its own actions, and I don't know if if there was an adequate uh, interaction between say the health ministry and and so on and 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 the rest of government in, in terms of thinking through what was working and what was not working. That that's with respect to COVID. But I was really I was really um, impressed by what you said at the beginning um, about the fact that there's a very little uh, commitment from, say, the establishment uh, for, for basic services like education and so on. And some things that came back to haunt you in terms of the systems that were not there when you needed them, right? Uh, but, but in particular in, in education, you spent some time in the Ministry of Education. I, I believe that was when um, uh, Minister Javier Jaime Saavedra, Jaime Saavedra uh, was there. And, and that, that ended up being sort of like rejected by, by the political system. 
when, when there was a real attempt at improving education, it, it kind of backfired. What can we learn from that backfire? What, what, what defends lousy, lousy education? Okay. Um, for the first question, I think that uh, in some way, uh, like most of the many tools that we implemented were done from scratch. Um, for instance, Reactiva, uh, FI, uh, looking like the lockdown and opening the economy. So I think that within the government, uh, we have learned from, I, 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 I don't know in, in what process pro probably is the importance to have public servants there always that are able to stay for a, for a long time. Um, I think that, um, for instance, uh, programs like Reactiva, we invested in all the design and now uh, the, transi the transition government is able to, um, to put it like uh, reprogram the, the loans or uh, think about other sectors. So, and, and also I think uh, even for the lockdown of the economy and, and opening the economy, we learned a lot. And you, and you have now that, uh, I think that at the beginning we didn't have much more information because also I think of the informality. For instance, uh, we, um, we also uh, locked down mining, but I think that in Peru, uh, and mining really explains like 10% of, of your income is a, a huge import, a part of your GDP, but it also, um, we have a lot of social conflicts with mining. So it was difficult for us uh, at the beginning uh, to ask for sacrifice to everybody and, and not, to, not to ask that for, for the mining. But I think that um, at the end of the day, what I think that's really, uh, I, I, like in my experience for, uh, on the Ministry of, of Finance, most of the uh, really, uh, uh, important part of the teams, especially like, for instance, the chief economy of, of the country, Alex Contreras, that he was with me at the beginning of, of, the, of the crisis and he's uh, still there. So I think that, well, that's what I, I really think about having a body of public servants that are there. So I think that the knowledge transmits between between people, we had a huge crisis. I don't know if you remember about that vacuna gate. And I think that lots of people changed in, in the Ministry of Health. Uh, but I think that I have came to the conclusion that having public servants with a lot uh, of technical that are able to, to learn from the experience and use it in different situations. So I, I think that having a body of public servants is, is really important that they're all, always in government. And the second, uh, it's it's very uh, interesting what happened uh, with Jaime. Uh, I think that what like um, what have happened in in the education system is that because of this lack of supervision, we have a uh, private universities that are really really a huge business, and I can say that in some cases there are suspects that they are a uh, laundry machines like there's money from narcotrafico so every time jaime uh, so usually these uh, corruption these corrupted uh, groups usually fund politicians usually fund campaigns so i think that a uh, even though it, uh, like this idea of being able, of being transparent with how you fund political campaigns is, is really relevant because I, I think that what happened with Jaime is that because he wanted to really improve learning outcomes in university and, and do a reform, he was blocked. He, wa he was blocked um, and he was invited to go, he was in fact impeached by, by Congress because he was, um, he was touching too many interests that we say, tocando muchos intereses. So, and, and what is interesting, I was part of, of, of Jaime, Jaime's team. And then I was, when the, the next minister was there. So the first, um, during Jaime's term, he had to, he was defeated by Fujimorismo, by the political party that was led by Keiko Fujimori and he was impeached by that. But then the next minister that came, he had to face this massive protest where Pedro Castillo was the leader. 
<laughs> so you can see how Pedro Castillo was the leader because it was this massive protest. They were, they were not, um, they didn't want this performance evaluation within the system. So I think that uh, what we really need is some pressure from the, from the citizens. And for me, that the best example of this is what happened with intensive care beds in the country. Like you have during years, you don't have capacity. When the crisis started, you had 100 intensive care beds. And then after six months, you had um, more than 1,000. Like you did in five or six months what the country was not able to do in decades because population was pressuring. So I really think that um, we have to make citizens pressure more for, for improving the learning outcomes in education. And I am, especially, um, we, personally, I have some doubts whether or not uh, the potential uh, for new president of, of the country will really uh, will really uh, support the reform and the and the la ley de carrera magisterial this this career of, of teachers and performance evaluation. So I, I really think that for me, what happened with the intensive care beds is an example that if citizens put something in agenda, the government mo moves to, uh, for, toward that. Thank you very much, Tony. I think that's it in terms of questions. So uh, I think I would just want to reiterate that we're very, very grateful to have had you. This has been amazing. We've had uh, about 100 people at the peak listening from all over the world, Kennedy School, uh, Peru, and pretty much everywhere else. Uh, and uh, we learned a lot, and we hope to have you here some, and sometime again. Some other Thank you Thank very much. You. And thank you everyone for, for listening today. Again, as we said, we can reach, uh, stay up to date with our research and events following us on social media and online. Thank you, and I will end this lesson.